I think that we're recording now. And so we have, you can see on the screen, Claude Debussy, the Impressionistic composer. You can see he lived, was born in the middle of the Civil War. How's that for a good place to be born? Except he wasn't born in the United States, but it was that same era. So you could picture in your mind maybe what they might have worn, what they might have eaten, how difficult it was maybe to survive in some ways. But it was about that time and, and into the, the 20th century, 1918. Let's see if we can get this. To change to the next screen. There we go. I want you to look at this painting. It's an impressionistic painting. And while you're looking, I want you to listen to this impressionistic music and see if you can get an idea of what impressionism might mean. If you'd like to tell us in your mic what you think or type in the chat, it's more about emotion. It's less about trying to get every little detail perfect. Macy, that's a very good explanation, both in music and in this painting. review the eras of music just for a little bit. Here we have the first four. One is medieval. It's where you have the monks all chanting the same line, the same music line, all together. They're not really staying in any form. You couldn't really say it was in the key of anything, but they're all the same, and it can be very beautiful. Um, I've, I think I mentioned before I attended a Catholic wedding mass, nuptial mass, and they did monophonic plain chant. The priest did it. Sometimes they had a musician up in the balcony in the choir loft singing it, and the organ was playing the same note that she was singing. It was, and that is, comes out of the medieval era. Um, church music, monophonic plain chant, mono meaning one melody. In the Renaissance, they started to experience with experience polyphonics. Part of the reason is because they could write it down. Gutenberg had invented his printing press, and music could now be written down, and people could learn it quicker because they could see it. They didn't have to memorize it by listening. And polyphonics, two, more than one melody, started to weave together to make their beautiful Renaissance music. The Baroque era, now they had polyphonics as well. Renaissance era polyphonics ran into the Baroque era, but now they experienced what they call tonality. And tonality means they you had a certain scale and there were certain notes that were proper in that scale and you stuck with those notes, like the key of C or the key of E flat. They also did major and minor so that it could be happy birthday with a happy sound or you could do happy birthday as a dirge, like when you turn 40 or something like that. So they had tonality now in the Baroque era that sort of standardized the sound and so they could have very complex polyphonics. Oh, there's another beautiful. We're going to turn that one off for just a second. Okay, then we have the classical era. Homophonics, which means there's one melody and all the other sounds are harmony or chordal support for that one sound. They could do that now with the piano. They had a loud and a soft pedal for one, for one thing, and orchestras could do that same thing. So homophonics means one melody, but much complex support for that melody. Then we have the Romantic era. 
The thing I like about the Romantic era is composers now no longer had to uh, compose like a journalist would write a story. They could compose what they wanted, what they felt like writing, and what people would pay for. So musicians had a greater chance of earning a living if they were very good and could compose what people wanted. They also could not earn a living if they didn't compose what people wanted and they insisted on composing what was just inside. There was a lot of patriotic music, a lot of music that was um, uh, dealt with their own folk climate and their own culture. So uh, they had dance music and other beautiful things that related to a certain part of their country and culture. Uh, um, the BYU International dance teams that, that dance to all these beautiful sounds with their beautiful costumes. Much of that came out of the Romantic era. Then we have the expression, the impress, Impressionistic era. You'll notice it's the shortest era. It's only about 20 years. Um, and it's when we look at that Impressionistic painting, we see that they have, in all Impressionistic painting, they use little short strokes and they have colors side by side that are different and they give the idea that light, however light reflects on that painting, gives you an idea of what they kind of mean. Um, so Macy is really right. They're not trying to tell you something. They're trying to give you the impression of something or the tone of something or the mood of something. And uh, that's the way the music is as well. Let's drop down to the modern era. The modern era now is going to be between um, 1890 and 1975. New ideas about what's beautiful. If you know anything about some of those years, some of the ideas of what was beautiful didn't seem beautiful to everyone. But there was a new way of thinking, new way of thinking about harmony and melody and rhythm, um, innovation and diversity. That kind of came out of the Impressionistic era. They had to decide whether they were going to stay with the rules of the Baroque era classical era or if they were going to do something new and they often did something new then the last one is the contemporary era and those dates continue to change because contemporary means today and so the music of today back in 1950 isn't the same as the music contemporary music today in 1975 till till now so we'll say that contemporary music adds electricity computers synthesizers all kinds of things that make music Definitely more interesting, sometimes more annoying, other times more available to people in huge crowds can now hear the Tabernacle Choir sing. Not all bad, but they do use electricity computers and synthesizers to augment whatever kind of music they want. And here we have Back to Impressionism. You can read what's on the screen. Art and music, the art, the art impressionism began sooner than music impressionism and probably lasted a little longer. And we're going to talk about these whole tone scales and hear them. Actually, you'll hear in the scale the things you heard in the music we just listened to. Claude Debussy did not like being called an impressionistic composer. He wanted people to think he just composed what he liked, what he liked to hear. But the world called him impressionistic because it reminded him of the art, um, impressionistic art, where he's creating a mood more than telling a detail. So learn a little bit about his childhood. That's him, cute little guy, in that pretty little dress that all babies wore back then, boys or girls. Here's a little bit about... His life, he was born, he was the oldest of five kids. His father owned a china shop. His mother was a seamstress. They moved to Paris in 1867 when he was five years old. But there was something more difficult about that childhood. What made it difficult, it was happened during, he was a little boy during the Franco-Prussian War. And the Franco-Prussian War was the precursor to the uh, World War I. Germany was flexing its muscles. It was a fight, Germany trying to take over parts of France. They succeeded. They were in Paris for nine months and three weeks. Leading up to that, Debussy's family lived in Paris. 
his mother took three of the children and escaped. And I'm going to show you. If, up here is Paris. And she took those three kids. Now, let's see. You're supposed to. Nope, you're supposed to show me the red pen. We're going to have the pen. I'm going to show you that she fled with her three children down to a little town here called Canis, France. And you can see that when she got there, one little baby boy was born in Canis, right at the beginning of that um, terror in Paris. And he only lived a month. The last little boy that was born... Uh, only lived three years. So the children that were it's born... Actually, yes. It's pronounced Canis. Thank you. Canis. Thank you. Have you been there? Or you just know French? No. No. But, um, well, like, I've been, been to France, but I haven't been to Con. Oh. Okay. Like, the, the ES part is a little bit silenced. Ah, Canis. Canis. Well, thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Um, I... I do the the distance you can see from Paris to Conneth, uh made her want to escape that war as quick as she could and as get as far away as she could down on the French Riviera on the Mediterranean Sea. But that was a sad time. War often is a sad time, especially for a young family. It's a very scary time. And then to have the tragedy of two children dying, I don't know why, but I can't help but think it was not made any better by having a war in your country. So his musical career, they actually moved down to Cannes and lived with an aunt. And the aunt was sort of a musician. And she uh, she gave uh, paid for him some piano lessons, for Claude some piano lessons. And he turned out to be a child prodigy. It was very, very good. Um, when he was 12, he became a Paris Conservatory student and won contests. When he was a little older, this is a picture of him. He is right down here. He's the one who played the piano in this, this uh, string trio, violin and a cello, and he was the piano, piano player. And he won awards there, too, um, and did very well with piano. He was, I should say, before we go on, a little bit argumentative. He wanted to do things his own way. Have you ever met anyone like that? He uh, wanted to compose the things he felt inside of him. He didn't want to follow the strict rules that they gave him. Um, he, when he got this scholarship, he lived an aristocratic lifestyle. Let me see if I can find the words they used to describe. Um, he didn't like, he, let's see. He found the aristocratic atmosphere and the artistic atmosphere stifling, the company boorish, the food bad, and the monastic quarters abominable. He didn't like, this was down in Rome, he didn't like the Italian opera. He was very depressed and he was unable to compose. He met Franz Liszt about this time, and we remember Franz Liszt was that great philanthropist and that great supporter of young musicians and artists. And Debussy was impressed by him and inspired somewhat by him and felt like he was a fabulous piano player. And that gave him a little bit of hope. But here's what he wrote when he was 22. Is there somebody who would like to read that? I know that it's turned to the side, but it's intentionally turned to the side. Is there someone who can read sideways and would mind reading that slowly to all of us? Um, I guess I could try. Go for it. Okay. I am sure the Institute would not approve, for naturally it regards the path which it ordains as the only right one, but there is no help for it. I am too enamored of my freedom, too fond of my own ideas. Anybody have a comment on that quote? Have you ever felt that way? He was unable to compose because he was depressed. He felt the artistic atmosphere in the school he was in to be stifling. The artistic atmosphere to be stifling. What could that mean? Uh, 
Um, well, stifling means like you feel kind of constrained or like it's difficult to breathe. It's kind of oppressive. So I guess he just felt kind of very enclosed, very claustrophobic when he thought about it. You know, it's very confining. Mm -hmm. Why would an artist be bothered by that, perhaps more than another? Um, you know, artists of the age, you know, to create something new, you have to look beyond what's already been done. And people who seek, people who are innovators, want something that's new. They don't want to feel confined because they feel that, you know, that affects not only their talent, but, you know, the way they think. So they want basically free reign. You know, when you have free reign, you're free. You can do whatever you want. You know, there's no bounds to your creativity levels. Right. You are right. That would be especially to someone who was creative that had some gift inside of them that didn't follow the rules. Annika, I can see your, um, your writing in there. It's not like he necessarily didn't want to follow rules of right and wrong, but he didn't want to follow the rules of what's already been done. And he said, I don't dare compose for this group. Because when I, I'm pretty sure that they won't approve of it. Because what I am creating doesn't follow their rules. But I can't stop. I'm too enamored with my own freedom. I'm too fond of my own ideas. And so he wrote four. Four compositions. And this was the response he got. Would that want, make you want to compose more for that group? Would you want to produce your best work, what you loved for a group that gave you this kind of a response? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, teenagers particularly find that that uh, rules to be not in the slightest no way. There you go. Well, that's the way Debussy felt. Now, one happiness in his life was his little daughter. And I'm going to turn a new piece of music on for you. Um, here we go. He wrote a suite of music called He wrote this for his little girl when she was three years old. Listen for a minute. Here's part B. If those of you who play music, here's where it changes a little. His little girl, whose name was Claude Emma, he called her Chow Chow. When she was, she was three years old when he wrote this suite of pieces, which are six little pieces. If you play all six in a row, it takes about 15 minutes to play. And each one tells a little story. Some of them are written in a Chinese scale. Some are written where you play the soft pedal. It's a lullaby for the whole song is a little lullaby. One is to a porcelain, a porcelain doll. You have to be very, very careful. Oh, here comes. This is called Gollywog's Cakewalk. 
It's a story of a popular little doll that was popular in that day. It's a little uh, black doll with red pants and red bow tie and wild hair that dances. It kind of is reminiscent of the minstrels that black their whole faces out with their mouth and their white eyes. Kind of ragtimey, kind of syncopated. Cute song. Has any of you have any of you ever heard anyone play that song or played it yourself? If not, you might look for Gollywog's Cakewalk and learn to play it because it is a fun song and it wows. It wows an audience. It's just cute, cute, cute. Um, so that's Gollywog's Cakewalk by Debussy. Now, I need to tell you about, he wrote some operas, and here's his most famous opera. And I should have you pronounce, anybody know how to pronounce French? Those words in there, it's in the names of two people. Shall I butcher it, or does somebody want to pronounce those for me? Okay, I'm just going to butcher it. After I do that, if someone wants to correct me, that's just fine. Peleus et Melisande. 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 It's the story. Um, it kind of is reminiscent of the trouble with feeling loved and accepted that Debussy had in his life. Not a happy marriage. Um, the only, there are those, in fact, the woman who played Melisande in this opera felt like that if W.C. ever loved anyone, it was his daughter, Chow Chow. And without her, he said in the last, the last few months of his life, he died of uh, cancer. He said that if it hadn't been for that little girl of his, he probably would have killed himself. But because of her, he did not. And this story is about a prince that goes into the woods and meets this girl. It's not the fellow, and it's his brother, actually. Uh, Prince Gowland, he meets Melisande and marries her, brings her back to the palace, and they seem happy. But as the years go by, she becomes more um, interested in his younger stepbrother, half-brother, I should say, his younger half-brother. And the rest of Prince Gulen's life, he is worried that his wife really loves his brother. And he goes to great lengths to try to figure out um, whether she does or not. It's, a, it's quite a sad opera. It doesn't appear that she wants to be unfaithful to her husband. And so finally, uh, Peleus, who is the younger half-brother, he decides he's going to leave forever. He just doesn't want to stir up the trouble anymore. And they meet in the woods for the last time. And uh, um, Prince Gowland sees them there. He gives kind of a um, an innocent kiss before he leaves. Prince Gallen doesn't understand exactly what's going on. He just feels like he's left out of it. And he kills his brother, his half-brother. And right after that, his wife, Melisande, dies in childbirth after giving birth to a little girl. It's quite a sad, tragic opera. And it, it kind of gives you an idea of the sadness that maybe Debussy felt. Um, but there it is an opera now. I think I, I have uh, – there is a YouTube – rendition of the entire opera and a lot of it has close captions if you want to to look at that and see part of it uh, it's very beautifully done and I can it's either in the module or I can send you the link for that I told you before that Debussy died it was a very harsh death for the last few months uh, he tried some ways to cure that cancer but it couldn't be done and he died in France in 1918 now it looks like an ordinary death. Cancer wasn't altogether uncommon back then. People died, of course. But just as the beginning of his life was fraught with war, so was the end of his life. The day he died, there was strategic bombing of his city, the city of Paris. And his funeral was not attended by anyone because the city was being bombed. And his casket and very tiny entourage went through the streets of Paris to the cemetery while the bombs were going off. It was years later that they they uh, moved his remains to a, a more a, a location more suited to the greatness and the grandness of his life. 
But hard times, uh, this war stuff is no fun. And it affects so many lives that we maybe don't think about. Uh, and so there he is. He's buried by his wife and his little daughter, unfortunately, Chow Chow, within a year. She had also died. She got diphtheria and was given the wrong medicine by a doctor. Uh, and she died. It, it's kind of um, a romantic twist to the story of his life. But he and his wife and his daughter are all buried together now. So let's talk about some impressionistic sounds. And to do that, we're going to watch first some scales that you're familiar with. Listen to these. Sound familiar? You're welcome to chat away now. Recognize those? Now they just changed keys. They're playing major scales. Okay, now Bach and Mozart and Beethoven all use those scales. Now you know what a chromatic scale is. If we talk about a linear chromatic scale, that's like a chromatic scale um, and it's used in jazz and bebop. And so I'm going to let you listen to, I think this is the one, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker play Hot House. And I want you to listen to that there is no major and minor scale in this. We're going to see a lot of chromatic notes in uh, that they use in jazz, and it's a chromatic note that you would never see in a major or minor piece. So let's listen to this. I'll move it in. This was very famous jazz when my dad was little. scales are different. The sound is different. Those fellas can play all night long because it's not, not always written music. They're just... Yes. Is somebody wanting to say something there? Okay, what do you think? Can you hear the difference in the scales there from just those? Those ones that are familiar to our ear are not the ones that they would play in bebop and jazz. Now I'm going to let you listen to a different kind of a scale. It's called the whole tone scale. Can you see here? Whole, whole, whole. Those are the steps on the piano. To go from this note to this note is a whole step. To go from this note to this note is a whole step. Each key is this a half step, half step, half step, half step, half step, half step. All of these notes in this scale are going to be whole steps. Hello and welcome to another free. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the whole tone scale. And this scale you've probably heard in uh, different cartoons or movies when the person goes into a dream sequence and it sounds like this. And what that sound is, is the whole tone scale. And it's, it's, uh, there's, there's only two basic um, structures of it on the piano, but they follow an easy formula, easier than major, easier than minor, easier than even the pentatonic. Um, and as you could probably guess, um, they consist solely of whole steps. So if you start from anywhere on the keyboard and go up in whole steps, that's what's going to give you that sound like that. So starting from C, for example, if you go up in whole steps, you've got whole step, whole step, whole step, whole step, whole step, whole step. Um, and if you notice, easy way I like to think of it is it's three white keys, three black keys, all the way up. Three whites, three blacks, three whites, three blacks. Um, and then... If you, there's only one other formation of it, and that's if you were to say start from C sharp, 
you're going to have two black keys, four white keys, two black keys, four white keys. So, and it's going to sound the same way. So, that's why I say there's just two basic formations of it, like this and like that. And they all consist of whole steps. So if you ever forget what notes they are, just pick a note on the keyboard and go up or down in whole steps. And you'll have that sound. Uh, if you have any other questions, visit our There you go. Now, I'm glad you think that's cool. It does sound cool. You'll never have a whole tone scale that's a C whole tone or an F whole tone because all of the tones are the same. It doesn't matter where you start. It's like he said, there's only two ways to do it and it all sounds the same. It won't be different like um, in major and minor scales. I'm going to let you listen to a song and see if you can hear the whole tone scale in this piece of music. This is called Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, like in the Chronicles of Narnia Fawn, F-A-U-N. Even the harp plays in the whole tone scale. Now, can you imagine being told that's bizarre? I would have thought better of something when you hear a composition like this. I'm going to find. to that and watch it again in a minute but that is beautiful I am so grateful that he was strong enough to say I can't do what they say when I've got this kind of music inside of me so let me ask I have let me see if I can remember how to do this I'm going to give you a link in the chat box. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to put this in the chat box and I want you all to put it in your computer and it will let, let you, I hope, go to a screen that looks like what you see on the screen here. Oh good, I can see some of you there. What I want you to do is write your name here. Write your name in the top boxes. Uh, don't put two names in one box. Put one name in each box. Hmm, I don't see the, I can't see the. There we go, now I can see that all. Okay, now have you written names in here that I can't see? An anonymous, there we go, Macy, good, good, good. Is there someone who should have their name right here? I'm going to let you see the first question. Now, we're all able to type in here, I think. So where does where do innovation and good ideas come from? Now, we know Debussy had a lot of good ideas. And I'm wondering, in your life, in your world, where do good ideas come from? And if I were going to write something, I would say, um, Whoops, deep thought. Whoops. Better get that in there right. 
divinity, right, from heaven. Okay, any other ideas? Anybody else want to write their names up here and, and give your ideas? Um, how about... How about cooperation? Do you ever cooperate with others? I'm going to make those a little bit smaller. There we go. How about that? The spirit. Good. Is this working for you? Can you guys make this work? Good, Macy. I can see you are. Anything you write will be on here. All of you have the right to edit. Here's the next question. Hey, Lizzie. Are there only so many good ideas? I'm trying, but it isn't working. Keep trying. I can't write on it. I'm on my dad's phone, so I'm trying to get this to work. So sorry if I take forever. <laughs> okay, that is okay. Double click on the square you want to type in. Okay, that's a good suggestion for someone. Are there only so many good ideas? I think the people in WC school thought so. They thought that maybe they had already come up with all the good ideas that there are. Keep trying and answer as many of these questions as you can. Our emotions, yes. Good, Spencer. Here's the third question. Um, Sam, if you want to write your answers in the, I'll write your name here. If you want to write your answers in the chat, I'll transfer them over. There's an endless supply of good ideas. If we thought that, we would not have any new inventions. Boy, thank heaven people didn't think that. Oops, whoops, oops, I'm sorry. Good answers. You are all giving good answers. These two you can kind of answer at the same time. The entire modern era. Very good. Orange peanuts. Yoo-hoo! My computer. Indoor plumbing, thank heaven, air conditioning. I actually am in South Carolina today doing this class from our son's house. And we definitely are using the air conditioner down here today. Ah, somebody's got music in there. Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus. Oh, yeah. That? Communism, I should say. A new name for an old problem, huh? So how did Debussy determine his ideas and innovations were good? How do you think he did that? There you go. By the fruits of his thoughts. We can appreciate his thoughts, can't we? Because it was so wonderful. Let's see. Let me turn this. There we go. There we go. Confidence in himself. And you put question marks. Why did you put question marks there? I'm just curious.
I'm going to make the don't know. Well, I don't know how much confidence he had in himself either. I'm glad he had enough. I wonder if he could have composed more if he'd had a little encouragement. Well, what we're doing today is we're going to try to decide how to determine whether our ideas are good or not. Now, President Hinckley gave a talk called Life's Obligations, and he's talking to young people, not much old, older than you. And he says, we are faced with four obligations in life. And he's going to discuss them with you now. And the one we're going to choose is vocation. We're going to talk just about this one. Now, can you identify in this, in this little sentence here, a couple of sentences, write in this column some words. And you can all write in that same column, what are some key words in this, just this little paragraph? And if you, you can say them out loud and I'll type them in, or you can type them in or put them in the chat. Yeah, you don't, don't, let's not worry about the names because that, that leaves too many out. So just say, say the, like, maybe we could say obligations and you just tell me obligations and we'll type it in or you can type it in or type it in the chat. Put it at the top. Any other keywords? Application. Ooh, application. Yes, I've got to turn that down just a little. Okay, application. Discussion. Okay. discussion he's going to discuss it with you as opposed to telling you right and we want to make this to wrap around so it doesn't interfere with the next oops I'm in the wrong one again okay let's go to the next one the next paragraph now can you all see this where if you look down here Here's where we started, and then down here at the bottom there are these tabs, and now we're in the third tab, Hinkley 2. Can you see that now? Oh, good. A good question. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do is identify prophetic counsel in this little paragraph. We're going to identify the prophetic counsel, and then President Hinkley says, this is my counsel, and here are the reasons. I want you to identify the counsel and then the reasons. And I may make this smaller just so we can see everybody's better. Because I think you can read this. I hope you can read it pretty good. And I can see more of you. Anybody got any prophetic counsel or reasons? Possibility of the endless. Okay, yes. Annika, just put them right there. That's fine. We'll get this working. He asks us to choose a vocation, and what does it say there? I need to move this over. I can't see very well either. Choose a vocation you love. Now, could we put, could we change that, Sabrina and Alex, to say happy? Choose a vocation where you will be happy because you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life. That is right. Very good. You're very good. I'm sure the other kids are seeing this too. I wish I could see it. Here's the next one, and I'm going to make it smaller as well so that we can see more answers. Oh, maybe that's too small. I want you to look for the council. Emmeline, can you see it on the screen where I am? If you can't see it, 
Oh, I can see it on the screen. I just can't see where you can write down the answers. Okay, right. Uh, you see where it says Hinkley 3? If you click that on your computer, then you can write in any of these columns. Oh, go figure. And I'm supposed to be the tech savvy teenager over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes, supply the answer. What is the, what is the prophetic counsel here? And I'll read it. Choose something you enjoy doing. Income is important, but you do not need to become a multimillionaire to be happy. In fact, you're more likely to be unhappy if wealth becomes your only objective. You'll become a slave to it. It will color all your decisions. You need enough to get along. You need enough to provide well for your family. It'll be better if the husband becomes the provider and the wife does not work when children come. That situation may be necessary in some cases, but if you choose wisely now, it will not likely become a requirement. Okay, what's the prophetic counsel? Somebody else has got it. Anybody got an idea? What's the counsel there? What's person he's been telling you to give you as far as counsel? Choose what? be a millionaire. Not one of these. Now, would you mind if I put this down here? That's one of his reasons. He said, something you enjoy doing. You don't need to be a millionaire to be happy. For money, let's see. Let me read this. Whoa. Oh, I'm going to see if I can put that in there. There you go. That's Annika's. Now, because we don't have a lot of time, let's go to the next bit of counsel. In choosing a vocation, choose a field. Why or what? And why? Ooh, somebody, can somebody mute that, maybe? Yeah. Right, there we go. Thank you. I want you to be able to talk. What's the counsel? Haley, write it down if you can see it. First sentence. Choose a field in which you can grow. That's right. And what are the reasons? And somebody, Lizzie, maybe come down here and, and identify the warnings. Choose a field you can grow. And then he's going to tell you why. And then he's going to tell you what will happen if you don't. And what the dangers are. We could say in his counsel, he could also say, get all the schooling you can. We could write that in there. Maybe I'll write that after, well. And why do you need to get all the education you can? Oh, so we can. Here's somebody's comment over here. I just can't get it to, to come. Yeah. He also says the competition is terrible in the world. If you aren't educated, you can't compete. Unfortunately, in the world we live in, the competition is worse than it ever was before. Um, and so to get all the education you can will help you compete in that market. You all don't want to be so competitive that uh, all you do is focus on that. Let me let's see what somebody else has said over here. If you don't, you. Ah. It's your passion. You want to keep. Yes, that's why you want to um, do something that is stimulating. That's what I want right here. 
If you don't get the Alvi education, then you will be lost. You'll just be left behind. You are right. Um, okay, let's go to five. If you don't, you'll be lost in a world that's constantly changing and moving forward. In fact, he says a little later in the talk that you're not going to have just one occupation. You're going to have to learn to be flexible and to move from one in, one thing to another because the jobs that you're looking at right now won't even be in existence probably by the time you get into the workforce. Let's look at the next one. Sort of the same as before. Choose something that will be stimulating, thought-provoking, that will carry with it the day-to-day -day opportunity to do something to improve the society of which you will become a part. These are the great days of your preparation for future work. Don't waste them. Take advantage of them. Just cram your heads full of knowledge. Assimilate it, which is what we're doing now. Relate it to your own life, not just facts. Think about it. Let it become a part of you. Yes, choose, don't waste your education. Choose your career wisely. All of those are great that will inspire you and keep inspiring you. That is right. And if it stops, I suggest you move on to something else. Let's look at the last one before we end. Here's probably the most important one. With all this, choose a vocation you should bear in mind that there are other things in life of tremendous importance also. The greatest task of all, the greatest challenge, the greatest satisfaction lies in the rearing of a good family. There must also be time for service in the church. Otherwise, these very important dimensions of your life will be relegated to the back burner. And that's not where we want them. And I do want you to notice the warning. We're just about out of time, but I, what is the warning? Oops, there we go. That's right. If you don't set guidelines, then all the great ideas you have as far as your vocation goes, all of those great um, ideas will make the most important thing be relegated to the back burner and it will be neglected. And so we can learn from Debussy. Thank heaven he, he tucked his little chin in and moved forward in spite of the fact that those other, uh, the people that should have been helping him were telling him they didn't like his ideas because they were not the same as the ones that were familiar. And your ideas will be the same way, but I counsel you, I recommend you listen to the words of the prophets so that you can know if your ideas are good ideas and if they follow the Lord's plan for you. If you don't choose now, let me see what you're saying here. Uh, I've got to wrap this around. Yes. Do you understand how important it is to have guidelines? so that you can judge your own ideas or the ideas of others. Um, thank heaven, there's none, none of Debussy's music that would go against what's in the For the Strength of the Youth pamphlet. None of his music that I have ever heard would, would be in conflict for the, with the For the Strength of the Youth. If it was, I wouldn't have picked him to teach. But I did want to pick him so that you know that sometimes my generation is not very accommodating to the new ideas of your generation. But Heavenly Father is the one who will tell you whether your ideas are good. And if they are, you do the same thing as Debussy did. You just move forward. And you create beautiful things that are inside of you no matter what you choose to do, whether it's medicine or business or music. Um, all of those things are wonderful. And um, don't be afraid of change. We don't need to be afraid of change if the Lord is on our side. And I can tell you that that is true. And um, I'm glad you're all here today. I don't know how, uh, after I stop the recording, I want you to tell me what you think of this Google Doc idea. If you think you and I can make this work, I would love to see that it, it would work. Let me uh, 
stop the recording. Uh oh, maybe it wasn't recording.